So I'm Tommaso Poggio, and uh, you have heard uh, already from Jim and Daniela about science and about engineering. Um, science of intelligence meant as, um, as science of, uh, um, um, of uh, natural things, you know, chemistry, physiology, neuroscience, um, and engineering as the building artifacts, understanding how they work. This includes, of course, uh, for instance, uh, microelectronics and uh, even mathematics. I consider it as part of engineering. Now, why science and engineering? I'll be very brief. Just look at two recent success stories in AI that I could argue these are the main two in recent years. One is uh, AlphaGo winning against human champions at Go. This is a system developed by DeepMind, which is part of Google. And the other one is autonomous driving. And uh, Mobileye is a leading company, now part of Intel, that developed is a leader in um, visual-based autonomous driving. So um, the point I want to make here is that these two success stories are based on two key algorithms in modern, in modern artificial intelligence, in modern machine learning. One is reinforcement learning, and the other one is deep learning. And both of them come from neuroscience. If you look at um, reinforcement learning, it came from um, essentially studying uh, the, the psychology of animal learning with Pavlov and then Donald Hebb, and so on. The first person who realized the relevance of this working psychology for artificial system was, was probably Marvin Minsky, who is in the 50s developed a system called SNARK that was able to solve a maze like a mouse does by trial and error. And it was made up of neurons. And one neuron is shown there, was implemented by several vacuum tubes. And the current MIT experts on reinforcement learning, I, uh, I know uh, one of them, um, Leslie Kelbling, is in the audience. Another one is Dimitri Bertsekas. Uh, deep learning was uh, um, um, addressed already by Jim DiCarlo. It started with work by David Hubers and Thorsten Wiesel at Harvard. Who they recorded from individual neurons in the visual cortex of monkeys and cats. So they suggested a system that was made up of several layers of neurons, each one with local connectivity. And then there were models by Fukushima and others, our labs and Jim's labs, and uh, uh, modern deep uh, learning networks like ResNets have exactly the same layer architecture with local connectivity. Now, um, of course, at MIT, we have been acting on these ideas for some time. And uh, um, the history of this is about eight years ago, Raphael Reif, who was then pro the provost of MIT, challenged the BCS department to come up with a bold vision for the future. Mirgan Kasur was the chairman of the department. He put together Josh Tenenbaum and myself in an effort that we called the Intelligence Initiative, supported by the Dean of Science, um, which reached across the various schools of the institutes and funded seed projects in the science, engineering, and social and economic Im impact of intelligence. There are several of the speakers who are part of this and more people in the audience. Now, through NSF funding, <coughs> the intelligence initiative became more focused and morphed into the Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines. Uh, I think it's appropriate to think of CBMM as part of the core of IQ, in the same way that DeepMind is part of Alphabet. Um, in fact, there is a very 
interesting, important link between CBMEM and IQ. Um, David Siegel was the, the very first member of the advisory committee of CBMM five years ago. For CBMM, the problem of intelligence is one of the great problems in science. Personally, I think the problem of intelligence is the greatest problem in science, greater than problems such as the origin of life or the origin of the universe. We could argue about it. Um, and, and so our goal at CBMM is, um, is to develop the science and engineering of intelligence, um, to understand what, how the brain creates the mind, how to make intelligent machines. And clearly the combination of science and engineering in this is very blurred. But the fact that we have projects that are science projects in, on intelligence, engineering projects in intelligence, and projects that requires both science and engineering, I think this is the unique feature of MIT and difficult to replicate anywhere else. Jim DiCarlo showed earlier, and you'll hear more from Josh Tenenbaum, showed several moonshot projects. Uh, CBMM is involved in um, one, is the one about visual intelligence, about scene understanding. Um, the project is really trying to understand and simulate our unique ability um, and that none of the deep learning system can achieve so far, which is the ability to answer any question you can be asked about the environment you perceive around you and without any pre-training. Here, for instance, uh, this is a, a picture of a dinner after a CBMM workshop in a nice place in Europe. And you can see, understand what is going on, kind of guess about discussion at the different tables. You know immediately how you'd have to navigate if you want to reach the only empty table at the extreme left. You have these illusions of seeing everything around you and understanding what's going on. It's an illusion which is really computed by various parts of our brain, which are more than just the ventral pathway, the input from the eye to visual cortex, involves other areas. That's what we're trying to sort out with cognitive and neuroscience techniques and try to simulate this in computers. Um, and this also after um, trying to answer the question of, um, what is behind in terms of the brain, what is behind this perceptual illusion of perceiving everything with high resolution, understanding everything around you, the perceptual equivalent of cogito ergo sum. So, of course, this project uh, of scene understanding of visual intelligence is just one of the several projects you need to attack in order to solve the problem of intelligence, and so MIT IQ is the way forward. Um, now, while pushing um, beyond deep learning, since everybody seems to think, and I agree, that intelligence is much more than deep learning, we have also been developing a theory of, of deep networks, because, uh, because it is actually an interesting ir irony is that uh, the excitement about deep learning um, has um, the, the fact that nobody really understand why deep networks work as well as they do. And, um, and so, um, let me tell you some of these uh, um, the question we are trying to answer in order to develop a theory that explain when deep networks work and when they don't work. And there are these three questions that were listed before, which are really in approximation theory, in optimization theory, and in machine learning. The first one is the one on 
power of approximation. How powerful are deep networks relative to networks with one hidden layers, shallow networks, in representing a task, a function, an input to output mapping. There was an old result in the 80s that said any uh, network, even with one layer of nonlinear units, can approximate any continuous function on a bounded interval. And this seems the, the end of the story. But it's interesting that this has what is called curse of dimensionality. The number of units you need to do this approximation depends exponentially on the accuracy epsilon you want to achieve, and the exponent is the dimensionality of the function, how many inputs the function has. And so it's epsilon, one over epsilon is 10, 10% 10 error. One 10 to the D can be very large if D, say, is a few thousands inputs like pixels in an image. So this is a real, really serious problem, this curse of dimensionality. It turns out that for certain classes of function that essentially represent tasks that you can think of like uh, are decomposable, where you can speak of things that are made up of parts, which are themselves parts in larger objects, like, say, text. Text is made up of paragraphs, paragraphs are made up of sentences, sentences are made up of wor words, words are made up of letters. For compositional functions, turns out that deep networks, but not shallow one, don't have the curse of dimensionality. The number of parameters depends not exponentially, but linearly in the dimensionality D. So this is an advantage for special classes of tasks for deep networks. And this brings up another question about, which is almost philosophical, whether the fact that a word appeared to us um, pretty much decomposable, as I said, text, speech, even what we see, there are objects and parts and scenes. Um, whether this is due to physics, is because the world is made this way, or our brain, because we see it this way. I, I leave this question open for the question part and go to finish because I'm over time. Um, just to mention that we have good answer to also the other puzzles and so, uh, and so even deep learning um, is on its way to have a deep, no pun intended, mathematical theory. Now, of course, the theory is important to satisfy our basic curiosity for scientific understanding and for opening the way to better engineering, all of which is what IQ is about. Thank you.